introduced myself, I can skip that part of the uh, preliminary. But I would like to start with the, uh, the welcome to country and to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and indeed to any other Indigenous Australians who happen to be with us, along with this um, large and growing and no doubt interested crowd. Um, Centre for Advanced Journalism um, is a major endeavour and commitment in the Faculty of Arts and indeed across the university. So as Dean of Arts, it's great to be here to support um, another one of their uh, important events and to welcome um, the director uh, of the centre, Michael Gawenda, who will um, shortly complete his time as director and will be searching for a new Michael, impossible though that um, seems, but I'm glad to report Michael will continue on with us um, in a research role and continue to give us advice on developing the Centre for Advanced Journalism into bigger and better things. So, with no further um, preliminaries from me, let me hand over to Michael to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mark. Um, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, um, introduce Tim, um, who I've known for many years. Uh, we actually, Tim and I actually belong to the same tribe in, in a way. Um, not the religious tribe. Uh, I suppose it is a sort of religious tribe. We're both passionate Essendon supporters um, and have spent much time uh, discussing the pros and cons of where we were and where we're heading. I asked him tonight when I met him, how's he going? He said, he's going as well as the bombers, which means he's going pretty damn well. That's one reason why it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Tim. There are lots of other reasons. Um, I think Tim has been um, in many fields and in many ways a significant figure in the Australian community um, uh, as, a, uh, as an anti-gambling campaigner, um, as a campaigner for certain values that the community ought to uphold and share. Uh, as someone who has pushed to the forefront what should be a great concern for all of us, the state of the world, the fact that we live in a world where many people remain hungry and without hope, um, that we have responsibilities for those people and to those people. Um, I think Tim has been relentless uh, in his pursuit of an Australian community that is sensitive to what is going on in the rest of the world uh, in a way more relentless in that than anything else, I think, that, that Tim has done publicly. Uh, he, has been, he has been in his own way, um, and he will talk about this a bit uh, in his, uh, in his uh, lecture, which I'm sure we'll all enjoy. I've actually read it, um, and I'm sure uh, you'll all enjoy it. Uh, but in his way, Tim has been um, a major source of information for journalists um, over a range of issues, in, uh, you know, from uh, from local government uh, to uh, uh, the the problems with gambling. Uh, to, um, uh, to, to being a major source for, for journalists who land in disaster zones and don't know where to go, don't know who to talk to. Um, Tim has been there to talk to them. I assume he has continued to talk to them because it, for two reasons. One, he believes it's important that, uh, um, that, that journalists do a job of telling us what's going on in some of these places and the, and the problems uh, that that people and governments and aid agencies confront, and also because um, he hasn't, I hope this is true, Tim, been too burnt by journalists um, and has come to or always did appreciate that they have an important role to play and that most journalists actually want to play that role with uh, ethically, sensitively, um, uh, and with regard to the impact of their reporting. Um, so again, it gives me really great pleasure 
to introduce Tim tonight. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the lecture. When Tim finishes, we'll have some time for, for questions, but please join me now in welcoming Tim Costello. Well, good evening, and first of all, apologies for keeping you waiting. I uh, live over uh, the St Kilda side of the city, and Kingsway tonight is a complete car park, so uh, uh, that's my uh, frustration and uh, also uh, your patience. Um, I want to begin tonight by saying journalism is not the oldest profession, I'm told, but it is an absolutely vital one in a free society. And if a free society in freedom is to thrive, then for the global community to experience freedom, we need journalists. And uh, the health of journalists and journalism depends on self-reflection done in the public gaze. It depends on the capacity of journalists as a profession to advocate to their managers and their owners, their proprietors, for the resources and the mandate to do their job with integrity and excellence. So the context in which journalists and media organisations work will never stand still. The profession and industry in which it sits will be constantly working through what now constitutes excellence in journalism and how journalists interact with human uh, community and, it, and the community it serves. So that's just a way of really beginning by saying that uh, I feel a privilege to speak to this audience part of the emerging work of the Centre for Advanced Journalism. So thank you for being here tonight. Congratulations on a great beginning in the Centre, and particularly to Michael Gawenda, uh, who has been so associated with this Centre, and I'm glad to hear is uh, staying on to advise uh, here at the University of Melbourne. Well, tonight I'm here to talk about disasters. For World Vision, for the wider humanitarian community, disasters are not any more isolated events. They are happening, happening in rapid succession. They're integral to the work we do. They take a few forms. There's the emergency response in the intermediate aftermath of a natural disaster, of which we've uh, had so many in the beginning of 2011. Secondly, over a much longer term, the slow and sometimes torturous processes of rebuilding communities restoring livelihoods, healing broken lives. And the third category, responding to crises not caused by nature or by bad weather, but by human evil, the folly of war and conflict. If ever we should have learned by 2011 that uh, war has largely outlived the purposes we once thought it served. But we still are responding to the needs, to the uh, sometimes slowly unfolding, sometimes suddenly erupting moments of conflict and crisis, of refugees, displaced people, the injured, the bereaved, the vulnerable, the powerless, who just want to flee conflict. It has been, as you heard in the introduction, my duty and my privilege to be present amongst communities stricken by all these forms of disaster on many occasions. Although you might think that in these circumstances I have just one job to do and journalists have a completely different job, there is an extraordinary parallel symmetry, a congruence in the moral imperatives between what I do, working for a development organisation, and what journalists do. Practical and moral necessities that uh, drive both of us. Let me talk about the role of media in disasters. What is that role? I think it's agreed that media is to act as a witness, to act almost as a dispassionate observer. Should it be the media's objective purely to feed the appetite of media consumers as that intermediary, that witness and observer? When does it become a form of entertainment, of uh, simply satiating consumer appetites? When are there moral claims and journalists have to attend to moral claims and to a role as educators about human choices and human behaviours. I use the word to act as a witness. The word witness is interesting and uh, having been one who's also studied theology and learnt Greek and Hebrew, 
for that reason. The Greek word uh, for witness is the word martus, martyrios, often pronounced in Greek. Our word martyr comes from that word. Someone who suffers persecution, even death, for refusing to deny what they believe to be the truth, what they have seen. Journalists today still lose their lives. They are still martyrs because of what they've witnessed. Journalists today in far too many countries uh, go to prison because they speak about what they've seen truthfully. In that sense, journalists remain martyrios in that original sense. There is a profound moral dimension, not just a dispassionate observer feeding a scoop, a news line, a consumer appetite. We have now started to witness disasters in the developed world. I'm used to telling the story in the developing world. That's largely where World Vision has worked. However, we responded to the Christchurch earthquake. We are responding in Japan. Countries with capacity and resources and organisation and wealth and certainly a free press. Many of you watched the earthquake in Christchurch and the rescue unfolding on the afternoon of February the 22nd and might recall a moment of footage of a woman rescued from the top of the CTV building, Christchurch Television. An extension letter is raised, she is aided down to the fire truck and onto the ground where she turns and gets her first view of her office tower that hours before housed her and her co-workers, destroyed. And then, in grief, an extraordinary raw emotion, she collapses. If you watched it, it was incredibly painful to witness. Grief, shock, anguish, relief. And in witnessing it, I don't know if you felt like I did, you felt, boy, this is intrusive. Is it warranted? The camera then swung across to rescued office workers lying on the grass covered in blankets as their colleagues tried to identify them, tried to tend to their needs, to comfort them. Well, in that footage, there were a number of judgments being made about where to point the camera, what to focus on, what to edit, what to put to air, and most difficultly, all in real time, not, not easy calls. But the ethical questions of, we chose to point the camera there in that moment, are very real. In the Queensland floods, the so-called inland tsunami down Lockyer Valley, it was the same questions. And those floods being repaid, replayed as the Royal Commission goes on and the grief, the raw emotion, the nerves of people who lived through it now being exposed again. In general, it seemed that those affected in the Queensland flood seem not to be, to my view, similarly objectified. I was proud that they were portrayed as part of our community, our suffering, our family. There was, I think, greater empathy. They were subjects, not objects. But there is no fail-safe Newtonian test for this object-subject distinction. In Choosing to write an article, publish a photo, asking where a broadcast falls over the line as too intrusive, too graphic, too insensitive. It's something that one has to intuit. You have a sense about it, a gut reaction. The rules are not hard and fast. It's more Einstein than Newton. Everything, as Einstein taught us, is relative. And judgments need to be made not about an object in itself, but in relation to other factors and issues. Why in the Queensland floods? It was our suffering, our community, our tongue and tribe and mob. We were drawn into that. Of course, sometimes the issue is not ethical journalism, but simply competence. One of my colleagues was in London when the story was breaking about the tsunami and the Japanese nuclear plant. BBC TV News, the anchor crossed to their correspondent in Japan and said, so Mark, can you tell us what the situation is now? And back came the answer, well, I'm 60 miles from the scene of the disaster and let me tell you what the real problem is here. No one speaks English. 
That's what he said. No one speaks English. Here is this suffering, but this was the problem. Japanese, of course, is such an obscure language with uh, no, no, no thought to take a translator. He said, no one speaks English, so it's very hard for me to tell you what's happening. But, of course, it's the ethical lines that interest us most. Tonight, I'll reflect on whether in the recent coverage of disasters the line was crossed, why and what steps can be taken to improve or safeguard the best in journalism. I'll also be talking about how technology has increased our access to images, how traditional media is supplemented, sometimes supplanted by YouTube, by citizen journalists. So what does that do to the reporter's role? A professional reporter signed up to a standard of ethics in a space crowded by content. Well, the Journalist Code of Ethics gives some guidance. It's pretty explicit. It refers to honesty and accuracy. And most importantly, it acknowledges the media's position of power. That is incredibly important to acknowledge. The journalist isn't just an observer like wallpaper. They are affecting the events too. Perhaps aspirationally, the ethics code of ethics in its preamble says, journalists describe society to itself. Well, why do disasters interest the media? For myself, I think that the human species, and Michael's referred to this, is essentially tribal. We have a strong, innate drive to belong to family, to nation, and Michael's referred to those of us who belong to the tribe of Essendon. There's us who are chosen by God, and then there's all the rest. I'll never forget Michael being at the drawn grand final and um, last year. And if you're an Essendon supporter, uh, what goes with the territory is you just hate Collingwood. You don't mind anyone beating Collingwood. And it was a drawn grand final. And I remember this guy in his Collingwood jumper next to me was in tears when it was drawn, and I was even shocked. I was even sorry for him. I felt sympathy, though I hate Collingwood. And I said, it's not that bad, mate. You haven't lost, you haven't won, you've got next week. And he said, it's not that. I said, well, what is it? He said, my sister's getting married next Saturday, and now I have to tell her I'm not going to the wedding. <laughs> Confirmed all my prejudices about Collingwood supporters. Well, the tribal pull is true. In the proximity-laden way, the media reports any news, but especially in disasters. If an Australian dies in an overseas event, an earthquake, a tornado, or flood, it is big news in Australia. If many people, dozens or thousands, in some poor, far-flung region, it gets far less coverage. We are just tribal. You've heard of the one to 10 rule. One person affected by a disaster at home has equal media value of 10 in another developed country and add 100 if it's in a poor community, in a poor country. So the media, understandably, is tribal. It's also drawn to carnage. Moving pictures mesmerise us. Those stills can haunt or inspire us. People do want to read and hear about calamity. Maybe it's a way of comforting ourselves that it's someone else's nightmare. Maybe that is a voyeuristic. Perhaps we hang on to the possibility that our interest is profoundly linked to empathy. We want to know when people are facing disaster. We recognise something of ourselves in them. I hope that's the case. So the media will go there where the trouble is, especially, especially to a natural disaster, an act of God, an interesting term, but it usually reflects our utter powerlessness as humans to prevent it. So whatever the motivation for their presence, the reporting of disasters make the media a power player. There is a real effect from what the media covers in disasters, of what they choose to cover and also what they ignore. The famine in Ethiopia in 84, 85, out of which Live Aid came, out of which our mental pictures of what poverty in Australia uh, are, defined by poverty as a starving African child. It's interesting that uh, Australia is a long way from Africa, but still nearly 70% of World Vision child sponsors sponsor a child in Africa. Actually, the greatest number of the world's poor are in our region. Do you know that India, 
has almost as many absolutely poor, one nation, as the whole continent of Africa. Yet, poverty has been burnt into our mind as an African child, and it really was the way the media covered the Ethiopian crisis. It was presented as a disaster, if you know Mengistu and the Civil War and food hoarding as a weapon against the poor, politics played a big role. But the media covered it as a natural disaster. Bad weather and bad politics make a lethal, lethal mix. And it galvanised people into action. The Live Aid concerts, the passions of the Bonos, who actually was his first confrontation with po poverty, and since then has really become the prophet around making poverty history. Think of natural disasters in even first world countries and their impact on politics. In the US, a huge impact on the way President Bush handled or mishandled Hurricane Katrina. A natural disaster that in US politics uncovered a social disaster. And the way that social disaster was under the radar and no one really cared until the natural disaster of Katrina. Closer to home, the revival of Premier Anna Bly's political fortunes in Queensland. And of course, we've had our fair share of calamity in recent months. When you think about how these images burn into our mind, it makes me wonder what the media would have made or done with Pompeii if CNN or Al Jazeera had been around, the burning of Rome, Vesuvius. Each disaster is defined in some ways by the media and how we remember it. How they tell the story of how residents were affected and how a nation acted differently. The stoicism and the silence of the Japanese has burnt into our memory. The extraordinary stoical courage without demonstrative feelings is like, wow, that's extraordinary in understanding that culture. The images, the real-time unfolding of calamitous events are captivating. The endless replays of the most graphic clips etch moments into our minds. Watching these images stays with us for a long time and it's the media who have brought us those images. They have told us that side slant story. So, the media are critical to raising consciousness and touching conscience. When disaster hits poor countries, countries with limited resources, with government structures that are slow or inefficient in response, I've just come back from Pakistan three weeks ago, a government eight months after that disaster is still unable to help the 20 million people affected, 2 million homes destroyed, maybe a government unwilling to help the poorest of the poor. But when disasters hit poor countries, the media's ability to tell a story allows resources to be mobilised quickly. World Vision benefits. Communities affected benefit. This is why my work and the media's work is often uh, in parallel step. What about impact on journalists? Reporters who are on the ground often aren't thinking of the consequence of the work and how it's going to impact them. You see, the impact is much more powerful than how you read it in an article, how you see it on TV. It's visceral. It's the smell of dead bodies. I still can't get that out of my mind when I first went to the tsunami-affected areas and so many bodies of children and women lying around. So many of women and children because men were able to run faster and to hang on to trees and to survive. That's why there were so many children and women. But it's a smell that stays with you and stays with journalists. The impact for journalists in confronting interviews with grieving families. It's not something they can quarantine themselves from. You, the journalists, have human responses. Grief, often real trauma. Sometimes on the spot, sometimes pent up, only showing itself in emotional release and breakdown many years later. Sometimes a marriage that breaks down 20 years later that actually can be traced back to not dealing with that trauma that was just part of your job. News organisations have been slow to recognise the impacts of reporting on their staff. We have 
OHS officers who will tell you the right height of your desk uh, relative to your computer terminal, so you won't get RSI, but few who have understood and made provision for the risk of psychological scarring, of trauma. The lesson in the humanitarian sector is the same. We've had to invest very heavily in psychological safety, in debriefing, in counselling, in understanding that we too have not factored in just the longevity of trauma. I often find myself giving a speech, and it's not even a World Vision speech, about sad things. Sometimes it might be an after-dinner speech, uh, even humorous, and... Uh, I've had this experience a few times, out of nowhere, without warning, not seeing it, I found myself in tears. And what I realise is happening is some of the things I've seen that you only deal with by building compartments around, walls around, in order to cope and to go on. You've thought you've built a watertight wall and then out of nowhere the wall is leaking. And it really does shock you and surprise you. Well, I'm sure many journalists have seen peers self-medicate, drop out. The DART, the Centre for Journalism and Trauma, is proving to be a very valuable resource to help educate, to build resilience about these risks. Lisa Miller, now on the ABC's Washington, now the ABC's Washington Bureau Chief, was awarded a DART fellowship in 2007 and wrote about the impact on colleagues of, of confronting disasters and reporting. On the media report in 2008, she interviewed Jim McMillan, a senior photographer for the Philadelphia Daily News. Here's part of McMillan's story. Everybody was disturbed after September 11, and then there's a moment when you notice that they're not as disturbed as you still are. And that was a moment around Thanksgiving in 2001, two months after the attack, where I started noticing. I was visiting relatives, my family, my brother and sister near Boston. They're all talking again about football and shopping for the holidays. And all I could talk about or think about was ground zero. And that's when I caught on that I was now different to them. I didn't sleep for the next year and a half. I slept for two hours a night. And that was then complicated with problems of concentration, memory problems, speech problems, con currently withdrawing from what was then the most important relationship in my life. Despite that, Macmillan went on to cover Iraq for Associated Press. But he said even September the 11th and the chaos and horror of Baghdad after the fall of Saddam couldn't erase memories of Christmas Eve 20 years earlier. I was a young freelancer. I'd been sent to cover a house fire in Boston in which three children and their babysitter died. I'd watched as a woman approached the scene, wearing a Santa Claus hat and carrying two bags from Toys R Us. I saw her alarm as she saw something wrong in her street, flashing light from police cars and fire engines. I saw her alarm increase as she realised something must be wrong and maybe catching on that something was terribly wrong and getting close enough to see it was her house. And then I watched as a fire department chaplain walked up and told her her three children were dead. Miller posed this question. Sorry, Miller posed a question and he answered. He froze, Miller speaking, Macmillan speaking. Should he take a photo? Should he respect the privacy of the mother as she learns of the death of her children? So what did he do? Macmillan said, another photograph st photographer stepped up, stepped up really close and took her picture. And so I did the same thing, boom, boom, you know, flash right in her face. I don't know if it added to her trauma. I don't know. I mean, you think, right, like, my children are dead and somebody's taking my picture at the moment, I hear it. It probably didn't matter to her, but I am ashamed of what I did. I certainly wasn't helping her. Well, for so long, the media has run to the front line of events that most others run from. That's where aid workers and media are similar. 
Our staff are going into disaster zones when DFAT is ordering everybody else out. When the editor and the proprietor is ordering journalists in, everybody is scrambling to get out. And you're expected to be bulletproof, to be a first responder, to remain unaffected by what you've seen. Instead, so many become uneasy, depressed, angry, numb, even alcoholic. I'll never forget my surprise after my first disaster brought on by war, Darfur, Sudan, talking to woman after woman who'd been raped, her daughters raped, her mother raped, just the systematic, malevolent violence of the Janjaweed. And I came back and having been my first disaster, um, I did a press conference um, and on that press conference when asked a particular question, I just burst into tears. Here I had no real understanding yet of just how you can't leave it behind. You can't just be a professional. You can't just pass on, as your duty is, the cause. You are caught up in it. Well, the picture of the alcoholic journalist was stereotypical in an era when ed editors told you just to suck it up and get on with the job. This new self-educational approach is not about avoiding the tough roles, but it's actually about uh, understanding them, making them sustainable. So reporters can maintain their work, leading to more experienced hands and better reportage. It's also about more ethical behaviour towards, towards media staff by organisations whose whole business models are under threat from an increasingly fractured digital information landscape. So what about ethical reporting itself and respectful treatment of interview subjects during disasters? Dart Centre has this to offer. Always treat victims with dignity and respect. It's the golden rule, really. The way you want to be treated in a similar situation. It's a really simple test. How would I want to be treated if it was me? Approach survivors, but do it with sensitivity. Know when and how to back off. Clearly identify yourself. Expect to receive a harsh reaction at first, especially from parents of child victims. Don't respond by reacting harshly back. I'm just doing my job. You can say you're sorry for a person's loss, but never say, I understand. Never say, I know how you feel. Don't overwhelm them with the hardest questions first. Begin with questions such as, can you tell me about this person's life? Then listen. The worst mistake a reporter can make is to talk too much. For communities, find positive ways people are helping. Include acts of kindness. Report on them throughout the recovery process. It provides hope for a community. They aren't just defined by a disaster. Constantly ask these questions of yourself and your managers. Well, what does the public need to know? How much coverage is too much? When does a medium become infatuated with a story when the public is not? A community is much more than a mass killing or a disaster. The coverage must reflect that. I think that last sentiment is key to ethical reporting. Communities are people who are multidimensional. They're not defined by tragic events. Their name, their identity, shouldn't simply become a byword for death and horror. Yet if I mention Snowtown, Lockyer Valley, Arche, we all know because media defines images what comes to mind. Well, I've talked about impact on aid workers and media for aid and relief for our emergency staff. It's a very similar impact as it can be for journalists. Maybe for us as aid workers there is consolation and powerful psychological uh, resilience from knowing that our work is to directly respond, to stay with those who are in need. The journalist, because of short attention spans of the public, moves on. And it's the next uh, story. So, whether it's the journalist, the cameraman, the sound operator, where the link might be less direct, less, less distinct, whether their role is to secure images, and stories and transmit them to a wire service, to a newsroom thousands of kilometres away, to be delivered by our others juxtaposed between consumer ads 
And the next trivial, almost certainly trivial news item, it's really important to think through the impact on you of that. However, carefully and respectfully telling the personal tales of grief, however carefully you gather them, does not ever guarantee they will retain that level of gravitas on delivery. That is an editor's decision. So we must consider not just the particular reporter and the media professional on the ground, but the entire organisation. The news values and choices of editing and presentation, it plays an incredible part in the impact and, and effect of disaster coverage. And of course, reporting of disasters is not the exclusive province of so-called hard news and current affairs. TV morning shows have a format that blends news and entertainment and advertising and commentary and it reaches huge audiences. Does it change the cast of a network's coverage when a disaster is being reported directly often by a morning show host on the spot who's jumped on the plane? Is it now a disaster with the lighter touch and tone? Still doing the show and all the fun, light stuff, but with the disaster as the backdrop. Very curious to actually ask about this, this shift and whether it's a trivialising of what we're trying to report. News organisations need to ask themselves about this trend. Who attends disasters? Well, there's two types of first responders, aid workers and journalists. It's amazing when you're on a plane heading straight up within 24 hours that it's the journalists who are there with you. And you do bond. You arrive and events are chaotic and unfolding. In the many disaster zones I've been to, I have tried to be a global voice for World Vision about the impacts on people. Aid workers are frequently new sources, as Michael said. Even now, the events in Libya are including reports from aid workers on the ground as the Gaddafi forces and the rebels present their political, often slanted, version of events. Verification is impossible. Thus, aid workers there are turned to as a neutral, reliable source. This happened to me when Cyclone Nargis hit Burma a few years back. 150,000 people died. It was a government not giving out any visas. I got one because I hassled DFAT for the Burmese ambassador's number in Canberra. He's mobile. I rang him. I said, I'm Tim Costello from World Vision. He said, oh, Tim Costello. He said, I've seen you on TV. I said, oh, that's good. I need a visa. We've got 800 staff there. Many of them have lost family. I need to get there. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, our government has it under control. Yeah, you won't need to go. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I need to be there. Many of my staff, they are shattered. They are struggling. I need to go there. Oh, he said, no, uh, we're not giving out visas. Then there was a long pause, and he said, I've seen you a lot on TV. <laughs> that, funnily enough, was the breakthrough. Being a B or C grade celebrity seemed to be enough to actually get a visa. Very few others got it. Hardly anyone else got it. The journalists that were in there were all on tourist visas. As soon as they were tracked down, they were thrown out. They came and interviewed me, and often in different locations with a hat, with a moustache, because every time their story went to air, they were tracked down and thrown out. And I, as the aid worker, made the decision that I was going to talk on CNN and BBC and uh, Al Jazeera about how the government simply wasn't allowing enough aid in, how our workers were seeing the military with the cameras rolling, handing over aid, as soon as the cameras stopped, literally taking that aid back from desperate people. To make that decision, I effectively became a journalist. And that pressure, along with others, finally saw the Burmese government, under international pressure, relent. It took far too long. Far too many people died needlessly because of their response. But we got control of a lot of the aid delivery and the reach and the effectiveness and a much bigger pipeline because some of us made the decision to act as journalists. Well, these are incredibly important things in terms of not just raising money and awareness and compassion, but political pressure. Political pressure that will 
be a matter of life and death for some people. I've talked to you about Pakistan and uh, the fact that journalists largely weren't there when this slow-moving tsunami went through, having been there just uh, a few weeks ago, seeing just still stagnant uh, fields of water with stag uh, fields with stagnant water, children wading through waist deep. It seems to go on forever. Malnutrition before these floods, terrible malnutrition afterwards. And yet, hardly anyone remembers Pakistan. The world and the media's attention span has moved on. These are huge challenges in the 1 to 10 rule or the 1 to 100 rule. I've talked a little bit about the overlap between media and humanitarian responses. I do believe our motivations intersect. I think that compassion for the plight of others is what lies at the heart of our joint interest. The intention of the aid sector is to act on that compassionate response, to assist those in need, to seek justice as well as compassion. We act from the heart, from a conviction that it's right. The media's intention is equally, I think, most of the time noble, to alert, to inform, to stimulate, but with some of the caveats that I've raised. The media's intention is to provide a context for those with policy and executive decision-making authority to act, informed hopefully by public opinion and reaction, to support what's being done without rancour. But we always know that after a wonderful response of generosity and the stories told, the story will always move this way. The next story within six to eight weeks will be some aid organisation or military person who has ripped off aid. And just one story, as tiny as it might be in proportion to what's happened, will be enough for always the public to go, there you go, I gave, I dug deep, and look, look what's happened. The media telling those stories, because there always will be some fraud, as we understand in Australia, there always will be some fraud. The recent Murdoch Press's attack on foreign aid uh, really was a very good example of this. So many fraud cases, AusAid money wasted. Actually, it was 0.2% of aid since 1990 under the FOIs. Far less fraud, by the way, than Centrelink and countless other government departments spending the dollar here. But, of course, the Murdoch Press didn't tell you that. They just played to the caricature that aid is always corrupt. These stories will always follow this trajectory. It will go from uh, compassion to fraud. And there will be some fraud, but the damage that that often does is way out of proportion to the fraud. So let me try and pull this together. Ethical reporting is having a code of ethics. It means reporters must have in mind a duty as does a doctor who signs a Hippocratic oath to do no harm, to act with conscience. Just stepping aside from natural disasters to human-induced ones for the minute. So many of us witnessed the footage of a woman in, a trip in Tripoli who attended a hotel where foreign journalists were having breakfast and who began to protest her treatment at the hands of the Gaddafi regime, claiming she had been raped and beaten. As I recall, she was grabbed by security guards and she was being really arrested, and some in the media contingent tried to intervene, pushing the guards away, seeking to prevent her from being manhandled. I was fascinated how this passionate observation gave way to instinctive reaction. Was that ethical journalism? I actually think it showed how this object-subject distinction so often collapses. In the situations we're talking about, the categories of journalist or aid worker also often collapse. Whatever your preference, it's not an option to not get involved. In the situations we're talking about, to be involved is to say, I am a professional journalist, but I'm also a human with prior ethical commitments if I can respond to respond to put away the scoop mentality that might keep you in a box of I'm just the journalist and to think about how is my behaviour acceptable, what do I do here. 
Very briefly on social media, veteran ABC reporter and presenter of PM Mark Colvin last week wrote a piece reflecting on the history of journalism and its transformation by the new social media technologies. In the last year or so, social media has brought an even more revolutionary development. It's transforming our approach to reporting disasters and conflict. In the last few weeks, uh, it's brought the voices of a senior Yemeni government minister, Mohammed Abulahum, a young man living in the besieged city of Zawiya in Libya, Sara, an Egyptian woman telling us how she's been inside the sacked Secret Service headquarters, Mohammed, a Bahrainian photographer, describing live how advancing troops are firing on a crowd of protesters. Danny Tragonin, an Australian woman on the 10th floor of a hotel in Honolulu, as the Japanese earthquake tsunami, describing Hawaii's uh, preparations for that expected tsunami. How did we get all those interviews? Through Twitter, through Facebook and Skype. In covering the aftermath of Japan's quake and tsunami, Mark wrote that Twitter has given a new real-time information source. Twitter is brilliant for breaking stories and news. It's been one of the keys to covering Japan's earthquake, tsunami and nuclear crisis. On the day they had established the 20 kilometer zone, published the number of people who had to leave, they had also established a 30 kilometer stain door zone without saying how many would be affected. Mark says, I asked the question on Twitter and within five minutes, people had sent me the exact census figures for the Fukushima area and analyzed them to extrapolate the figures for the zone. So Twitter figures like Time Out Tokyo, Tokyo Reporter, W7VOA, Voice of America, Steve Herman, kept us ahead of the curve in reporting aftershocks, tsunami effects, nuclear crisis developments, the effect on people. Here was the case of blending the Twitter information with old-fashioned journalism and research. So, it's not the case that the function value or rules of journalism have fundamentally changed, and Mark believes those who proclaim the end is nigh miss the point. As he wrote in a column uh, last July, in the 40s and 50s, comic, book, comic books and rock music were going to turn the young into juvenile delinquents. In the 60s, when I was growing up, television was going to rot our brains. Now the producers of television and other mainstream media are worried that the young aren't consuming enough of them. Well, no, that's because the next generation have started to see media not as a box that squirts our content, content but as a two-way transaction, a field in which they can contribute as well as just receive. You've all followed the discussion about the Facebook revolution across North Africa, the impact that media is having. In Haiti, there's been a fantastic move to citizen journalism. In Kenya, mobile phone penetration of one in three gives rapid access to news. After the quake in Japan, many turned to YouTube as their news source. So, in managing this overload, there is a critical role for reporters and news medias to act as curators of information, to make sense of the barrage, to turn sensory overload into digestible, useful articles and broadcasts. Even as there are citizen journalists, in instant wire services and feeds of images, far greater in content than any bureau could manage. So the job of the media organization, print, radio and television is now as curator to help the reader, the viewer, make sense of it all. This is incredibly important in starting to understand how you report on disasters, how you think about in India, when the monsoon failed in 2009, it took a matter of months before the debt burden of poor farmers led to an extraordinary increase in farmer suicides. Without assets, access to credit, social resilience that our farmers in Australia have, they just started killing themselves. One lost crop can mean they never es escape the spiral of choking finance and debt. But who was reporting that? So I'd like to conclude by saying I think the profession of journalism and the industry of media are at a fascinating and critical point in their development. 
speaking recently with some young journalists just starting out in their careers, I became aware that their outlook on their professional future is not as linear or straightforward as years gone by. As a profession, it's crowded and competitive. As an industry, it's coming to grips with evolving technologies, evolving audiences. As an industry, it's seeing boundaries melt between observer and participant, professional journalist and citizen journalist. Citizen journalism is exciting and authentic, but if we only have citizen journalists, what might we lose? Who will keep watch on the new media, give guidance, uphold integrity, exercise accountability, have a code of ethics? So I have witnessed the human reality of disasters. I've been both partner and consumer in the work of disaster reporting. I believe that if you had the privilege of being there at the raw edge of pain, you have the corresponding duty of integrity, of care for consequences, of respect for those you serve. Excellence, excellence in journalism depends on exercising not just your professional skill, but your full human capacity. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Tim. Um, I think we'll take some questions now from, from you. There'll be microphones going around, so just uh, put your hand up and um, ask a question. disaster that you think is particularly well covered recently? Is there one that you would hold up as an example of how we can do it right? Well, the tsunami was extraordinarily well covered and um, I was up there, but I know those of you here because it was holiday time, uh, because Australians died and that always means that there is this sense of, wow, we would find family or communities in grief and uh, will understand the impact of this. When you've got Ray Martin with a current affair still in Bandai Aceh a month after the disaster, when you have um, journalists going back six months later and 12 months later, as we did, I think that tsunami actually was one where the attention span didn't just move on to the next one. It was something that we did stay with and um, I... I happen to believe that one was well covered. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Martin Hurst, I'm the head of journalism at AUT in Auckland and was covering, uh, looking you. at the coverage uh, of Christchurch. I almost feel like there's an, a process of embedding going on now when journalists, particularly senior journalists like Ray Martin and like some of the senior television journalists in New Zealand were in Christchurch totally embedded with the uh, Crisis Management Centre at the, at the Christchurch Art Gallery. And what I found was that the, the more freelance journalists, the, the unilaterals, if you like, who were in the suburbs of Christchurch were doing much better coverage of the stories and the real impact on people. Because when they had somebody at the uh, media centre saying, we've just put a thousand portable toilets in Sumner, and then a journalist drives down the streets in Sumner and there are no, there are no toilets, people are still pooing in cans in their garden, you realise there's a bit of a disconnect between what's happening in the command centre. And it struck me very much like the Doha situation and the embeds in Iraq, to be honest. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, as to your first question, uh, it's an interesting um, thesis that it, uh, repeated images help us deal with grief. Um, I guess the two questions I've asked, if it's intrusive, what does it do to the people who are the subject of the image? Um, and the second thing is emotions, uh, as we all know, aren't right or wrong, they're just there. And as to how long it takes to exhaust and uh, really get over, there's a whole lot of unknowing here. Can you, can you, if you're only watching it on TV, really feel that emotion and, and exhaust it, would be the question I ask. Or is it too objectified to actually allow your process to actually engage? I don't know, but it's a really interesting question. And the embedding, I, I totally agree with you. One more question? Okay. <coughs> uh, 
Tim, firstly, I want to thank you very much for that uh, really wonderful lecture. And um, uh, I hope that we'll find a way for um, journalists around the country to, um, to read this lecture, to absorb it, to think about some of the issues you raised. And in fact, a week from today, actually a week and a day from today, we're going to have a, a panel discussion with some leading journalists um, about some of the issues that you've raised so that they can address some of those issues and perhaps provide an audience with, with some answers. Um, uh, I think it was a wonderful address. You raised some real, really important issues. I just want to make one small point about the centre. The centre has done um, uh, two studies now of, um, of the coverage of the Black Saturday bushfires. Half of that research project uh, involved talking to journalists uh, and photographers and news directors uh, about um, how they saw the coverage, why they behaved the way they did, um, uh, what they learned from, uh, from, from the coverage and what they went through personally. Uh, we had a uh, panel discussion with journalists uh, who had covered the, um, uh, the fires and during one of those panel discussions, a very senior reporter who, um, who um, throughout that morning looked okay and jolly and uh, uh, broke down and cried. Uh, uh, in the middle of a little speech he was giving about, um, about an experience that he'd had, and this was, I suppose, four months later, five months later. So that, uh, uh, this is a little plug for the centre. You can go to the centre's website, which is caj.unimelb.edu.au to read that report. There's a, there's a long report on, um, uh, on, on that research. We have now just completed what I think is unique research uh, that has looked at, that has interviewed people who were covered by these journalists, um, talking to them about how they saw the coverage, uh, the impact on them of being in the, me in the media, uh, their relationship with the journalists who interviewed them. Um, now, this is unique research. I don't know of anywhere else in the world that it's been done. Uh, and I think it's really important research because it, it goes to some of the questions you raised. Journalists do move on. They might not move on in, in terms of the trauma that they've been through, uh, but they do move on to other stories they often don't have the time to think about the impact that they've had on the people that they've covered, let alone on the general community, but the impact on the people that they've covered. Uh, we hope in the next month or so that uh, we'll have a, a finished report on that part of, of the research and we'll have some events uh, uh, with that. Um, a lot of the people raised the questions that you raised tonight. Um, how were they treated by the journalists? Were they treated with respect? Uh, they got to the, some of them got to the point where they were very open at the beginning, but within a while they thought they were being exploited. Um, uh, uh, they thought there were, had been enough questioning. Um, so, and there was the whole issue of our journalists trained uh, to deal with people who have just been through trauma. Most journalists aren't trained. They make assumptions about how those people might feel and be and what their state is, but they really don't know anything about what impact they might have uh, on asking cert by asking certain questions. Um, so with that, uh, uh, I guess I wanted to say that journalists are engaged with these questions that Tim raised tonight. They do talk about them a lot. I think they should talk about them more publicly rather than just amongst themselves. Um, so this is what the Centre's about making sure that journalists do account for the way they behave and what they do, uh, that there is a dialogue between journalists and media proprietors and the community. And Tim, you've been part of that tonight, and I thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me with, uh, in thanking Tim for what was a wonderful lecture? Thank you.